Welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. I wanted to put together something a little different for you today. You probably don't know, yet, that I spent some time learning the art of physical comedy. You might call it clown school, at the Celebration Barn here in South Paris, Maine. Looking back on the 15 years since then, it's remarkable how many things I learned about being present, about being a yes, and about rolling with whatever happens that actually apply in real life. I mean, it only makes sense, right? Otherwise, why would theater and comedy, good theater and comedy, be so compelling? In the words of Will Shakespeare, all the world's a stage, and today's guest is going to help you see how to use that to your advantage in life and in your relationship. First, let me ask you, what do you do to keep things playful with your partner? Are you inadvertently sabotaging the flow of good feelings, good energy, and goodwill in the way that you interact with each other? Is it possible that your fear of making mistakes is getting in the way of being fully there in the moment? Today's guest is going to talk about how to get over whatever fear is there so that you and your partner can keep building and growing in your connection. Our guest's name is Patty Stiles, and she is one of the world's foremost experts on the art of improvisational theater. She studied directly with Keith Johnstone, author of the book Impro, at the Loose Moose Theater in Canada, and has been working professionally acting, teaching, directing all over the world since 1983. In today's conversation, we're going to talk about how to foster trust, acceptance, and playfulness in your relationship, so that once you see your life as a great work of improvisation, you'll be able to do it better. She is in Australia right now, and I'm in the States, so it's already tomorrow morning for her there. So Patty Styles, thank you so much for being here with us on Relationship Alive. Thank you. Hello from the future. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I'm, now I have to think about a completely different questions to, to ask you. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't play the lottery. Uh, I should start. Um, Patty, I'm wondering if you could start just by telling, giving your definition of what is, what is good improvisation? And is there such a thing as bad improvisation? Hmm. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um and it's interesting because for me, it kind of goes into a couple of different categories. Um, there's the philosophy of improvisation, um, kind of how we work as an improviser in what we believe and what we value. And then there's the technique of improvisation uh, in how we construct the scenes, a show or an evening of entertainment. So... Um, Good and bad is going to be relative to each individual, In uh, one in the philosophy, in what they hold dear, uh, and also in the technique, what they're aiming to achieve. So for me personally, um, there, I believe that there is good improvisation and there's, there's bad improvisation. Um, for me, good improvisation in the philosophy is where we follow the motto of make your partner look good where you listen, you value their ideas, you contribute to their ideas, um, you're present in the moment, you're accepting the offers that are happening, and you're building on what's there. Um, in the technique, um, you're creating a story and trying to move into the unknown uh, to make something happen in the story. Bad improvisation for me in the philosophy is where people use other improvisers for their own success or gratification. They belittle fellow improvisers. Um, they're mean spirited. Um, and it's all about themselves. Uh, bad improvisation in the technical is where improvisers on stage are making it all about them. They forget about the audience and nothing happens or they just aim for a style of performance that maybe doesn't particularly speak to me. Yeah. Uh, so, so funny listening to that because I'm sure 
anyone, if you're listening to what Patty's saying, then you're like, oh yeah, this sounds like everything that we've been talking about. Um, you know, how to how to actually build something with your partner versus mm-hmm. having it be about you. Um, yeah, so much rich stuff there. I was wondering um, how much improv is funny versus just reflective of a whole variety of experience? I guess it depends on what school of improvisational thought that you're from and what uh, theatrically you're trying to achieve. So um, for me, I was taught by Keith Johnston, um, as you said at the beginning, and Keith is a playwright and works in theater. So along with his views of Um, how actors perform on stage and using improvisation as a way of making the stage a safe place. Um, It's also about storytelling. And when we focus on storytelling, that opens up a wide range of potential types of stories. It's, It's a huge palette. So it's not just about trying to be funny. It's about trying to tell the story. And if the story that's there is comedic, then that's the story we tell. If the story that's there is um, terrifying or dramatic or heartfelt or uh, mysterious or unsettling, then that's the story we tell because that's the story that's being asked to be told. There's other forms of improvisation where the objective is all about the funny. Um, That's not my world of improvisation. So for you then, where does improv, where, where do improv and real life overlap? Ah, well, I mean, theater is a window into human nature. Um, we learn how to create and construct theater through being observers of life. Um, you know, if you, anything that ends up on the stage is coming from who we are as humans and how we function in the world. How we work as actors is about studying that and learning how to be able to capture, reproduce the world. So theater in general is all about the human condition. Improvisation, um, especially in, in, for me in Keith's point of view in Keith's work, is even more finely tuned in how we operate. Um, a lot of Keats work comes from his reflections in a lot of different ways. So, uh, for him to kind of look back over his time in school and realize how hard his teachers worked to try to minimize creativity and independent thought, uh, in the students, um, him watching actors on stage and seeing how terrified they were of revealing anything or making mistakes. Um, and watching society in general, the, the masks that we wear, um, the authenticity in our communication or lack thereof, um, our ability to be present in a moment, um, to embrace failure and, and know that mistakes are where we truly learn. Society tends to value, promote, and expect what I think are are values that actually hold us back. Um, There's been a lot of focus on self. Um, And I wonder if that's actually making people healthier. Um, There's a lot of focus on success. And I don't think that makes people happier. it's, it's wonderful to watch a group of students start an improvisation class and when they learn that they can make mistakes and we're going to celebrate it, watching the fear and the anxiety drop off of people's shoulders that it's actually okay to make a mistake is amazing. To watch the joy in people's faces where someone's going to just say yes to their idea and be present with them and listen to them it brings me such joy to watch that, but it also brings me such sadness because I know that there's so many people that 
are walking around that don't get that in their daily life. Yeah, in my work with clients, I often find that people are afraid to get it wrong. And mm. a lot of what they're doing is managing either their emotional experience or trying to to manage their partner's emotional experience. And, and there's so much fear around messing up or pissing the other person off or you know, if I say what I really mean, like we won't have sex for the next three weeks or whatever it is, or, you know, can I really be truthful about how I'm feeling right now because because I'm sad or I'm uncomfortable or whatever it yeah. is. So I'm wondering how do you how do you get people to not be afraid of failure? <laughs> um it's it's an interesting process, and it changes depending on the dynamic of the room. So there isn't a, you know, five steps and suddenly everybody's embracing failure. <laughs> um, which is another thing. There are some forms of improvisation training that uh, really focus on sort of a checklist approach. And I believe there's a lot of value in the information that's contained in that checklist approach. But anytime you have a checklist, for me, I feel that you are kind of removing the most important element, which is the individuals that you're working with. Mm. And so when I walk into a room to teach, I have everything that I've experienced and everything I've been taught and everything I've learned. But until I actually meet the people in the room, I don't know the first step. Because an exercise with one group of people could unlock them, but another group of people could terrify them. So um, the first step for me is to kind of get a sense of the energy in the room, watching the body language of the students. Um, are they looking me in the eye or not? Are they making contact with each other or not? Um, do they look like they have their society mask up and they're trying to hold on to it? Um, do they look like they're trying to overcompensate because they think they need to act creatively because they're in a creative environment? So I try to pick up on that and then start to create an atmosphere and an environment where the students feel safe and comfortable um, before people can kind of embrace making mistakes. You need to create an, an atmosphere that allows for that because you're asking them to do something once a week for two hours that's outside of society's norm and the rest of the world is going to train them against. So it is a, a bit of a leap of faith and trust. So yeah, I start there with create an environment of, of trust, safety, um, and fun. One thing that you mentioned was that if someone makes a mistake, hmm. then their partner or partners, in the case of uh, multiple people, would be a yes to that mistake. And so what's funny to me is this idea that, okay, well, is there really a mistake then if, <laughs> if we're yes. being a yes to it? And, and maybe you could also just talk for a moment about, like, what does that mean to be a yes? We've actually addressed that on the podcast before in terms of, um, I mean, there are many different windows into that, but a common one is this notion that our partners are always making bids for our attention. Mm. And are you acknowledging those bids? And because it, and the hallmark of a good relationship is, a bid happens and it gets acknowledged by their by their partner in a positive way. So mm -hmm. not just a neutral way. So it's another way of being a yes. So I'm wondering in improv, what does it mean to be a yes? And how can you, could you quickly contrast that with people so that they'd, under, so that they'd understand like, okay, this is what being a yes is like. And then this is what being neutral or being a no or blocking would look like. Yeah. Um, so when you said about uh, mistake, you know, can you make a mistake? Uh, that's where it comes back to what I said earlier about the philosophy and the technique. 
So if someone says, hey, do you want to go to the park? And you say, no, not really. In improvisation, that would be considered a block. And a block is when you don't accept the offer and it prevents the story from continuing. So you can apply that to a conversation where someone says, you know, um, I'd really like to have a conversation with you about X. And you say, look, I'm really not into that. Well, that's a block because it's going to stop that conversation from happening. Um, the person who's been blocked feels devalued um, because they've taken the risk to, in an improv, they've taken a risk to offer a creative idea and it's been bounced back. In life, they've taken a risk to open a door of communication and it's been bounced back. Um, so that's, that's kind of blocking, uh, where an acceptance in an improvisation would be, hey, let's go to the park. And the person goes, great idea, which is valuing the idea. And then you can contribute to it. Um, I'll get the picnic basket, right? So that you're actually building on the idea as well. Um, in real life, you know, I'd like to talk to you about X. And instead of, no, I don't want to, you could say, you know, I think that's, uh, I'm really glad that you you want to talk to me about that. I'm very open to talking about it. And then you either start the conversation or if authentically you're not available to the conversation, you can be honest with that. I really appreciate that you want to talk about this. I really want to talk about it as well. Now is not the best time for me. Can we open this conversation later? Because people understand that, you know, the present moment may not be the best present moment for everybody, but devaluing the offer or blocking the offer, I think, is where people start pulling in, and that makes it very difficult. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it got me to thinking about what do you do if you, <laughs> what if you genuinely get tired of so the kinds of offers that someone may, <laughs> makes to you, you know, where you don't want to be a yes all the time. Um, maybe well, that has a little bit to do with how you trade making bids or making offers. Yeah. In, in, um, when we first start teaching improvisation, um, because we're trying to remove um, fear of failure, and a lot of that fear of failure is not being creative, clever, interesting, funny, unique, because people come into a creative space thinking that's what's being asked of them, that they have to be really funny, that they have to be really imaginative, they have to be really clever. So there's a lot of fear that comes up around that, because um, what if they're not? Um, where really what we're asking them to do is listen, be present, value their partner, and be obvious. What does that, that mean to be obvious? Um, if I say, um, I don't know, look out the window, you might feel, oh my gosh, I've got to be really, really clever. And so you might say, yes, look at that alien vessel dumping the ton of jello on the monkey. <laughs> That's not being obvious. That's really working hard to be clever. Right. Being obvious means um, responding within sort of the circle of expectations. So if I say, look out the window, you can say, what a gorgeous bird. Because that's an obvious thing if you look out the window. I'm actually looking at a bird right now looking out the window. Um, because it's not the idea it's how we use the idea. Um, one of Keith Johnstone's quotes, it's not the offer, it's what you do with the offer that makes or breaks the scene. And people focus so much on their contribution needing to be original and clever that they don't really listen, they don't hear, they don't value, and they don't use what their partner has said. 
So it becomes this snowball effect of ideas. Pretty much the same thing happens in conversation and particularly in arguments. It becomes a snowball of bits and pieces of information without anybody actually addressing the very first thing said. Because we're not present, we're already trying to think of our answer, our response. We're trying to defend, we're trying to protect, we're trying to one-up. You know, there's, there's a lot of fear around that. So in improvisation, we say, just be obvious. Look at the bird. And then I, I sort of cut you off there because I wanted to be clear about what being obvious meant and was asking the bigger question about when you're potentially being pummeled with offers by a person. Yes. Yeah, and what if you get uh, bored of those offers? Yeah. Uh, when you first start teaching people to improvise, you're really trying to teach them to be present and to accept everything, to not worry about good or bad or moving the story forward, to really value and accept your partner's ideas. Now, if I can focus you on really valuing your partner, it does two things. One, it creates this wonderful feeling of trust and positive energy because your partner starts feeling valued so they start to relax and be present also it gets you out of your your own fears and worries because you're focused on something else so you're not focused on your own failure and anxiety you're actually focused on a positive action which is to value other people which is really good so it allows you to be more present because you're not worried about what you're doing yeah. Later, when you start learning to perform improvisation and you get kind of more skill, you realize that everything is an offer. And so when I'm performing with um, people I know really well, you can be quite cheeky and you know if they're kind of making a lazy offer, like they're not really quite there or present with you. And if they're not, then it's kind of my job in making my partner look good to kind of give them a playful poke or kick in the butt and say, hey, be here. If my, my fellow performers are doing that for me and I'm doing that for them, you don't fall into the, the repetitive beige of going on autopilot. And I think that's when you get the del deluge of offers that you hear a thousand times mm -hmm. is when improvisers start just kind of checking out and not really truly being present. It's something that you always have to work on. It's not something that you learn in one class and it becomes this golden skill that you can apply at the drop of a hat. You do need to focus on it and you do need to give value to it and kind of take a breath and go, okay, I'm here. I love the approach of making your partner look good. Mm. It's, it's an amazing thing. And even, you know, in life, if you stop and do that, it can really help. So if I'm in a conversation, um, you know, with my, my partner or my friends or my family, and I feel the, you know, I don't want to be in this conversation or, I've got an appointment or, you know, life kicks in or anxiety kicks in or something comes up and I can feel myself being kind of pulled away from the moment. If I can catch myself, and I'm not an expert at it, I think it's a lifelong learning, but if I can catch myself and just remind myself, hey, make your partner look good, be present, value what they're saying, just be here, it always helps. You know, does it make the conversation less difficult? Well, it depends on the subject material. But it does make it richer and more available. So therefore, in a way, it is less difficult. Because I'm not fighting with myself, and I'm actually there. And I think that's important. And with all the distractions of society nowadays, and all the forms of communication that are actually communication with walls, that art of just truly being present, we all need to hold dear. 
I'm wondering if you've ever experimented with having improvisers in a class but keeping their cell phones on and like feeling free to check their texts and what that does for imp the improvisation that's happening? It's really interesting um, because I've been teaching for a while now. You get this evolution of students um, and students that come into the classroom because their life experience is different than other people of other ages or generations or experiences. And earlier this year, I was teaching a public workshop and three people in the class would keep pulling out their phones. And it just floored me because that wasn't a normal thing to see people pull out their phones. And I really wrestled with it because my first assumption was that they're not present here, they're not valuing this, and then the anxiety of what am I doing wrong? Why don't I have them engaged? Why aren't they present? Because um, I took it all in. So eventually I asked them one by one privately, you know, um, about the phones. And one fellow said, oh, I'm making notes. And it because I don't use my phone that way, I hadn't thought of that. He was actually making notes on things in the class because he was valuing the class. One fellow was checking in with someone who was ill, and he just didn't tell me. So he was using it for a personal reason. And the third fellow went, oh, is it distracting? Oh, sorry. So he was using it because he's been conditioned in a way to always check his phone every five or 10 minutes or whatever. Right. But it was really interesting to have those three different responses. No um, one was actually texting someone to say, I'm really present right now. I'm having such a good time in this class. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they, you know, various experiences and reasons and, and it made me realize, you know, one, how it was funny that I saw that and immediately took it to self. Mm. You know, I'm failing as a teacher because you guys are on your phones um, and not kind of giving the freedom of, all oh, right, it could actually be a device to capture information. Um, but then, you know, you look around at cafes and how many people are sitting with someone on a date and they're texting other people. Like, it's amazing how we don't value the present moment. We don't value the communication we're having. We have to keep telling everybody else about the communication we're having. That's, that's a fascinating cycle to me. Yeah, and if nothing else, that reflection of you saw the person on their phone and that immediately made you think, what, what am I doing? What am I, in fact, what am I doing wrong? You bet. Um, then... It's. I think it's pretty common for people to have that experience when they're with someone who starts texting or their attention wavers. And, hmm. and I think, you know, like I, I can't imagine going on a first date, you know, with all the nerves and excitement and anxiety that a first date brings, all that, you know, delicious stew of weird emotions you know, you've prepared for it, you know, you've chosen what you're going to wear or you've decided where you're going to go and, you know, all that anticipation. And you sit down and 10, 15 minutes in, they're texting someone else. Yeah, I mean, that makes me think about how um, they've done studies that show that when you text or when you receive a text that you actually get a little hit of dopamine. Mm. Um, so it makes me think that in some respects, that's probably a way that people are compensating for those jittery feelings that they're having on a date because maybe they haven't learned how to actually be present with those feelings and, and presence those feelings in, you know, with the person that they're with. So they're maybe chasing those little hits of dopamine to help, self-medicate. Yeah, I think it's, it's very um, Pavlovian how we've been trained. You know, someone texts and we need to know immediately. Um, and it feels, 
it, in some ways it feels very high school. You know, I got to know what's going on right now. I got to know what people are thinking about me. I got to know what's happening. I've got to be in touch. And that, that heightened energy and anxiety to answer immediately all the time, to be on deck all the time, the culture of busy that we're currently in, you say to someone, how are you? And they say, I'm so busy. That's not how you are. That's what you're doing. Mm. It, there is a difference. Um, and people have various levels of busy. But people need to say they're busy because if they don't say they're busy, then they don't feel that they're achieving or keeping up with everybody. It's, it's a really dangerous path that we're on. Um, you know, I was, I was joking around one day at a party saying, you know, wouldn't it be kind of cool to have people show up at a party and everybody have to put their phones into a locked box? And just for one evening, actually just be in the room with everybody without the phone. And someone said, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. What about this? What about that? What about this? And I went, it wasn't so long ago that people would get together and spend a whole evening together without being contactable by anybody else. It wasn't that long ago that families could go away on a weekend and not have to worry about work. These phones should be a convenience. They shouldn't be such a distraction and demand. So That's what's another tool that you use when you when you have people walk through the door and at least psychically check their phone at the door um, to, to help them get really present with each other and, and get onto that page of like, I'm going to be present. I'm going to listen. I'm going to make you look good. Mm. There's a, there's a lot of improvisation games. Um, so when Keith Johnstone creates an exercise, uh, we often call the exercises games, I think because when Keith developed theater sports, it was a bit more sporty to say, we're going to play a game instead of we're going to play an exercise. Um, I don't know if that's true. That seems, it seems to make sense in my logic. I'll have to ask him. Um, but there's a lot of exercises where Keith would watch the behavior of the improvisers and then identify kind of what was holding them back or locking them up or preventing the scene from progressing. And then he would develop an exercise to train people away from that or out of that in kind of a fun, playful way. So, for example, there's a, a game called A Word at a Time Story, which is a pretty classic impro game. And in this game, two people or more Usually when I'm teaching it, especially with beginners, I use the two. Two people are telling a story, alternating back and forth one word at a time. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you were going to play it with me right now, uh, if I said we gave a big hug to the best friend that I ever had. So there you go. We created a sentence in a word at a time. Now what that does is it technically makes you be present because unless you hear what your partner says, you can't fulfill your role. So if you're really afraid of not being able to do your role, it actually focuses you on your partner. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, if you start thinking ahead, you very quickly realize that you haven't heard. And that kind of gives you a self-reflection. If you start pushing or driving or forcing, it doesn't work. So your tool of, I'm going to take charge and make this work, actually doesn't work. If your defense is, I'm just going to sit back and, and not contribute because I'm really afraid, well, that doesn't work. It has to be balanced with both people actually present or it doesn't flow. Years later, Keith then added in um, another device to make it even more playful and to really embrace failure, which is as you're creating the story, 
if at any time you feel pressure or anxiety, or you see in your partner's face that maybe they're feeling a bit anxious or uncertain or they're not having a good time, you joyfully throw your hands up in the air and happily yell, again! And then you just start a new one. <laughs> so if we were doing one right now, um, we can again, <laughs> I, you know, and it, it does what you just did, which you kind of laugh uh -huh. because it, it removes the need to succeed. It removes the need to deliver. It removes the, the end objective and makes it present mm. and in a playful way. So if I screw up and you joyously yell again, it doesn't feel like a punishment. Yeah, in fact, I can even imagine it if you're not alternating words, but if you're, you know, when you have a, an argument with someone and you're just going down that road and you're like, I, you know, I don't even want to say this thing, but I'm going to say it because, you know, that kind of spiraling negativity yeah. that can happen, interjecting a big again and hopefully yeah. the other person w would, they'd know what you're doing and it would be a cue um, to come back into the present with each other because most of that spiraling isn't about the present. Absolutely. And it, it does. It really connects you back to the present. So when I'm teaching it, I'll say to people, you know, if your partner looks at the ground, if they look up in the air, if, they, if they're not kind of present with you, say again, make your partner look good by help training them to be present. Um, so then it's kind of fun because when they say again, the person realizes they've been staring at the floor and they can have a laugh at themselves. Yeah. And then they start kind of conditioning themselves. All oh, right. I was looking at the floor. Okay. Look at you. And those are active things that you can do that help keep you present instead of giving you the overriding concept, be present, which people will struggle with. I'm saying, you know, lift your eyes from the floor, look at your partner. That's something active that you can do, and you don't have to get into any heavy theory on that. It's, it's an active thing, and through the action of doing that, it helps keep you present. Mm. It also helps you be present with the information that's being shared, right, um, which is really important. There's, there's an example of we were present in something, that happened, and it throws us out of the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I, if I say, you know, um, even the act of watch for if your partner looks stressed. In, you know, that really helps. Mm. Because when someone removes the stress from you, it's actually a really nice feeling. You know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, thank you. Because we're conditioned to struggle. We're conditioned to fight. We're conditioned to live with the stress. If I'm stressed, I have to figure my way through it. I have to do this. I have to do that. When someone removes the struggle from you and says, no, don't worry about it. Just be here. It's really a nice feeling. And when you get to be a more experienced improviser, your fellow improvisers do that to you in a lot of different ways. Um, they kind of call you on your crap, but it's done playfully and with love and support and joy. So it's really nice when they do that, because it just makes you go, boom, I'm present. You're right. I was starting to worry about success. I was starting to worry about delivery. I was starting to worry about, and you just came up and creatively gave me a little, hey, here now, please. Yeah, what would that look like? Uh, an example that happened a um, few years ago. Uh, oh, my head's just flooded with a lot of examples. I'm very fortunate to have so many wonderful improvisers around me. <laughs> um, there was a show, and there was a scene going on on stage, and I knew that something was needed in the narrative. So I kind of came on stage, and I was standing to the side kind of listening, but being in the scene listening. But I knew I was kind of up in my head going, what is going on? And then a friend of mine, Rama, came out from behind me and she just lifted me up. And that act of being lifted in a supportive, playful way with her laughing removed all the anxiety and focus forward. And when I looked into her eyes, I was like, you're right. You completely caught me. 
on me not being here. And you did something playful and joyous to go, hey, I'm here with you. Be here with me. Let's play. And it was exactly what was needed. And from that act and from us kind of connecting, we found what was needed in the scene. I'm thinking about couples who are stuck. Mm. And there are a couple points, one being the one that you just made, and then earlier when we were talking about the need to be creative or not wanting to be boring. And and those those two things just kind of collapsed into this moment for me of, oh yeah, what about when this happens all the time when you are in a stuck place where you feel like ah, I'm not like I'm not being interesting enough or oh, there we go we're arguing again and and I can imagine someone being like how do I do something interesting or how do I do something playful that's going to break this negative thing that's about to happen and we just discussed one possible example of that with the again um, oh. I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit in terms of how do you how do you work with boring how do you work with routine how do you dive into that and and come out the other side in a place that feels more rich ooh big question um in in life when when a friend says to me you know that in their relationship they feel that they're not interesting enough and that they're boring and that they're it hurts me because everybody is perfect in themselves. You are who you are. And when someone's kind of being that self-critical, there, there's a lot of questions around that for me. Mm. Um, because they're saying, I'm boring. Not... You know, me and my partner, we don't do things together. They're saying, I'm boring. That, those are two different conversations. If it's, you know, my partner and I have fallen into the, you know, we work all day, we come home, we watch TV, we go to bed, we work all day, we come home, we watch TV, we go to bed. That's recognizing that a relationship is the contribution of the people involved. Um, right. And that breaking the pattern is the contribution of the people involved. And both people are equally um, responsible for that contribution, just like in an improvisation scene. Um, if my partner on stage, or if, if my partner in, in, in my improv group is saying, I feel boring, um, then a part of me goes, ah, who, what am I? I'm not making them look good. If they feel boring, I'm not making them look good. Because it's not the offer, it's what we do with it that makes or breaks the scene. So in life, it's kind of the same. You know, it's, it's what we do with the opportunities, the information. It's what we do with the conversation. It's what we do in the present moment that'll make or break our moving forward. Um, as may, humans, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it may not surprise you to know that, because probably because you run into this in your classes as well, that many people deep down are actually scared of making their partner look good. Absolutely, because we live in a culture of competition. And competition and cooperation don't work hand in hand. Um, now, I've had someone argue that with me and say, well, on a hockey team, they have to cooperate. And I go, yeah, but in the team, they're not competing. That team has to cooperate to compete. But if you have two people, if you're cooperating, it's a different conversation than if you're competing. And I think in a lot of relationships on stage and off, people are competing for value and self-worth and acceptance, survival and achievement. When that comes into our impro work on stage, that's when people start making the scenes all about them 
and making the scene all about getting the audience to love them and making the scene all about getting the audience to laugh so that the improviser feels fulfilled. The focus is no longer on make your partner look good. The focus is no longer on being present and valuing. The focus is no longer on the story. The focus now is all about self. And I think the same is true in life. When people feel vulnerable or they feel that they need to survive or they start making a relationship all about them, they're no longer present in the story of the relationship. The, you know, our lives together, you know, they're, they're stories. So what's your story with that person? And are you accepting the offers to help build that story? Or are you blocking the offers, which is preventing that story from, contribu- from continuing and developing? Do you have any exercises that are specifically around that question of making your partner look good? Um, ooh, yes. Um, she says and then pauses. Because <laughs> sometimes it's hard to explain the exercise in, in just words mm-hmm. um, because so much of it is also about the eye contact and the energy and, and what's happening between those two individuals. And I could explain the exercise with two people and then another two people and the explanation can change because you have to use what's actually happening with those people. Mm. Uh, but the word at a time is, is definitely one. Um, even simple things like um, a game of yes, let's, for example. And this, this is kind of a fun uh, warm-up exercise where someone makes a suggestion and your partner or partners, it could be the whole room of people, say yes, let's, and you do it. Um, so if I said, you know, uh, let's all jump up and down, you would say, yes, let's exactly. And you say it without reservation, without condemnation, without judgment, you say it enthusiastically and then we do it. And then someone else says something and we do that. And just being able to trust that whatever comes out of my mouth, everybody's going to say, yes, let's too, helps make me look good and helps remove my worry about what's coming out of my mouth. It's also kind of a fun thing to do with your partner, to have a night of yes, let's, Mm. you know, or with your friends. Uh, I had a a magical night in Dublin with a a couple of actor friends of mine where basically we did that. One person would say, let's do this. And we would go, yes, let's. We'd go do that. And then another one of us would make a suggestion and off we went. And uh, it was a lovely, playful evening of a lot of experiences and joy. So, you know, imagine a date day where you just alternate what you're doing. Even the simplest thing of, let's go get a coffee. Yes, let's. Without hesitation or reservation, go get a coffee. It's just a coffee. Yeah, I can already imagine Chloe, my partner, listening to this episode and saying, let's put up that curtain rod that we haven't put up for the past three months. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, let's. let's. Why not? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Get it, and get it done enthusiastically so that chores aren't chores and, and someone saying, hey, there's that thing we haven't done doesn't become a criticism and a condemnation about what you haven't done. It's just information about an offer. Yeah. If we look at things as just offers and information and we take the emotion out of it, it helps. Um, you know, it, it, it really helps. Um, it's hard to, cause we're, we are emotional creatures. Um, and we do view things through that filter. Um, but if you play a game of yes, let's and go, all right. Um, and if you're worried about that, you can always add in what we call the happy nope. Where, um, and we do this in a game called, uh, called what comes next, where, um, you know, uh, you would say, what comes next? And I would make a suggestion. So um, let's say I'm, I'm going to say what comes next and you make a suggestion. Okay. So I go, what comes next? You say, let's. Let's burp for five minutes. Yes, let's. And then we do that. Mm-hmm. However, I could also do a happy nope. So if I say, what comes next? Let's rub elbows together. Nope. 
and then you'd immediately make another suggestion. I would make another suggestion. Yeah, so that we don't put a lot of uh, emphasis on the suggestions being right, wrong, good, bad. Mm. We just allow. So if, if my gut impulse is like, hmm, doesn't inspire, wouldn't make me feel good, then my nope is information for you in how to make me look good. Mm. It's not a judgment on your idea being right or wrong. Because your aim is to try to learn what would be fun for me. Yeah, and that gets back to that question of how can you say, how do you say no? Yeah. And if you say playfully and, and maybe also mm, for the right reason, right might be the wrong word there. Um, because if you say, if you, if you make suggestions for self and controlling reasons, that's different than if you make suggestions for your partner's joy. Mm. So if I have the opportunity to say, nope, to help you learn more about what brings me joy, then it becomes a really fun game, which could also be another nice kind of date night or date day where you don't have to worry about planning the perfect day. You can just make random ideas and see what actually brings them joy. Mm. You know, let's have a margarita. Nope. It's like, oh, wow, right. Okay. I thought you loved margaritas. Okay. Right. And just an, if you look at it as just an opportunity to learn about your partner, instead of them judging your ideas, it becomes a different game. Yeah. And that requires just that simple buy-in at the beginning that we're... We're making each other look good. We're we're interested in inspiring each other's joy. Absolutely, absolutely. If you can get, if you can get to that place, you know, if you can kind of go through life with make your partner look good, and inspiring their joy. Imagine the value you can contribute to your partner's world. Mm. And if there's someone that you love and that you're choosing to spend time with because you you value them and you love them. Wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah. Yeah, no. absolutely. And you'd want to, and you'd be in that positive, a positive spiral of ever increasing joy and knowing each other. And that seems like a pretty good definition of intimacy to me. Yeah. I mean, you know, imagine, you know, in, in, um, you know, in bed just for some fun sexual play, you get to do yes, let's, mm. you know, but you can have the happy note because of course you want people to feel self, you know, safe and secure and, and that they're enjoying it, you know, so let's do this. Yes, let's, who knows <laughs> what they're going to say yes, let's do, mm. you know, and that's one of the joys in an impro class and working with improvisers is that, you know, you tend to go, oh, they're not want to, they're not going to want to do this, that, or the other thing. But when you make the suggestion, it's really fun to see creatively the worlds that people do want to go into. And then you learn about someone. You know, you go, uh, let's jump off the cliff head first. And they go, yes, let's. You go, really? Okay, let's do it. Um, <laughs> and that was the end of that class. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm talking creatively, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, actually going to a cliff. I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, pretendy land cliffs. Right, right. Um, but, you know, it's, we hold each other back because of these assumptions. Uh, and it's fun to get into creative games where you go, oh, right, hang on. And I think in relationships, we do tend to put people into boxes and use past information and not always current information because we don't always pay attention to what's happening today. Yeah, I'm imagining this as being a really beautiful way for people to to engage with each other, to combat those assumptions that they're making about each other or feeling trapped by the other person's assumptions. It's mm. like you need to have the you need to have the agreements in place about it so that you both understand what you're doing um and but then once you do then yeah what a wonderful opportunity I wonder if you have something that's specifically about that like if 
if another person, um, like let's say my partner were making an assumption about me, mm. is there a playful or a, an improv way to interrupt that that inspires... I mean, I guess you could, with this vocabulary, you could just say, nope. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, you know, absolutely. A lot of this comes down to the, you know, like you said, the agreement between two people to play the game, um, to know where you're coming from and why, which is why, you know, when we first start an improvisation class, we need to bring people into a place of, trust, acceptance, and play. So that when we get into these games where you are saying nope and again and and looking at the creative, we've got that foundation of, of you know, the trust and the play and um, the make your partner look good and being present. Because if you don't have that foundation, the games become slightly different, which um, there's quite a few improvisation approaches where the teachers forget to bring that foundation in first. Um, so the games kind of develop differently. Mm. Um, so of course you and your partner have to have that freedom. But if you, if you agree to, Hey, let's use some impro philosophy in, in our relationship and let's play, you know, a yes, let's game or, um, you know, then even the language of, uh, accepting and blocking, you know, can come in. Um, when it comes to assumptions, that's interesting because assumptions, assumptions often come out of a moment. So if I parallel that to impro world with storytelling, it's going to be different every scene and every situation. So then why it arrived and how it arrived and what it is is going to be different. So there isn't sort of a, an absolute on that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, because did that assumption come out of the offer before or did that assumption come out without the person seeing the offer before? Like is it, is it an assumption of an offer four years ago or was it actually – out of the moment, which would change the approach in the story of what exercise I would use to deal with that. Yeah. I would, like, what if we went with the four years ago? Mm. So if, I'm just playing through in my head. Because I can't tell you how many times that comes up with a client where, uh, or, you know, couples who are working together where someone says, you know, like, well, I thought you didn't like such and such. And, and the other will be like, well, what do you mean? I love that. And, the, but four years ago, when we were at the ice cream place, you, you said you, you absolutely didn't want vanilla and you would never want vanilla, but now you're telling me you love vanilla. You know, it's <laughs> that kind of thing happens all the time. Yes. Yes. Yeah, my husband and I do that to each other a lot. Oh, wait a minute, didn't you say this? It's not, no, yeah, you did. Oh, it's not what I meant. Um, look, there, there's an exercise I did um, with a, a, a company I work with here that I'm artistic director of in from Melbourne, where at the beginning of the year, I asked everybody to take a, a piece of paper and write down um, all the impro games um, that they dislike or are bored of currently. Um, and that could be the game, the setup, the genre, right? So that, so that the stuff that's kind of, ugh. And then another piece of paper to write down all the uh, games or exercises or setups that are currently inspiring them. So they had two lists, one that was, if you will, kind of the, the negative and one, if you will, kind of the positive. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, I want you to go up to a fellow improviser and I want you to guess four things on their negative list and four things on their positive list. Right? So I would come up to you and I'd say, Neil, um, on your negative list would be 
um, westerns, uh, playing the die game, um, doing solo scenes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And on your positive would be blah, 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 blah. It was amazing how many times people got at the opposite. Hmm. Where people were saying, on your list of what you're bored with is this, and what you love is this. And people were going, no, actually, I'm, I, I'm, the stuff you think I love, I'm actually bored with. And the stuff you think I dislike, I'm actually excited by. And it was kind of the, the ability we have to put people in boxes and keep them in that box. When we learn a piece of information, it goes to the, the file of this identifies you, which doesn't allow for growth. Yeah. So maybe at one time in your impro development, you hated Westerns because you just couldn't find a way into it. But now maybe you're really excited by the challenge of that. So why am I holding you in the box of you don't like it? Mm. And underneath all of that is, I've made an assumption. I haven't actually asked you where you're at. So I'm not being present with you. I'm holding you to your past. Right. So am I making you look good? You yeah, know, and, not. Yeah. No. And, you know, as I love working with improvisers who, who know the world that I love, and know the areas that I'm challenged by. And they will inspire me and challenge me in my challenges while being completely supportive and playful. So they don't, they don't assume that I can't. They assume that I'm always ready and able and I'm just where I am on that day. Mm. And they'll step up with me and hold my hand and be ready to be there with me. And I love that because then you get thrown into real wonderful challenges and you get a chance to explore and you feel valued. You feel like someone thinks the best of you. Instead of when people go, oh, Patty doesn't like to play X, so we're going to do this scene and we won't ask her to come up. Then I feel kind of held back. I feel like you've condemned me to not being able to do it instead of the assumption of, yeah, you can do it. Maybe not perfectly, maybe not today, but you can do it. And we're going to keep pitching this ball until one day you hit it out of the park. Yeah. And as many grounders as you make, we're going to be happy and we're going to play those grounders with you. That's fine. Uh, I love playing with those people because they, I feel that they make me look good. Yeah. So, and what I'm what I'm hearing from you is that that's a combination of them coming to be actually curious about you and what and and knowing oh this thing challenges you, and then finding a way to dive into something that's a challenge in a way that's compassionate and supportive. Yeah, they don't. They don't hold me to my past. They look at me today in the present. And then they go, okay, you know, what's a fun challenge? Because we believe in you, you know. Um, and in relationships, I think, you know, with the swirl of life and finances and, you know, raising children and managing jobs and families and, dealing with elderly parents and, you know, all the, the complex, rich, beautiful, difficult, wondrous challenges of life, the people that are closest to us, we run the risk of putting them in a, in a comfort zone and going, good, I can rely on that comfort zone. I don't have to work as hard as I did on the first date to get to know you <laughs> or, or to show my best side. Um, and then we spend all this energy on people that are kind of transient relationships, ones that kind of come in and go out within a month or two and which, you know, bring their own lessons and joy. We, we need to always keep making our partners look good, mm. you know, especially when it gets the most difficult, when you feel like you just want to put their head through a wall, 
that's when you need to go, okay, hang on. Let's just take a, <laughs> let's do a little happy again or a nope or let's just be present or, you know, let's just call recess. Let's just take a five minute walk around. Yeah. And I love the idea of going home and making that list of like, what are four things that I think you love and what are four things I think you're bored with and, and comparing that with your partner's version and. Yeah. yeah so. Well, in in the exercise, you would make so Neil would make a list of things that Neil is bored with, and Neil would make a list of things that currently excite him. Right, and your mm-hmm. partner would do that list for herself. Okay. So you you've got your list of bored and your list of inspire. Got it. And then then you try to guess what's on her list. So I don't have a list in front of me. I'm actually just thinking of things out loud and what I think she would put on the on various list. list. Got it. Yeah, it's a little bit more like Battleship. <laughs> right? Great. Uh, I mean, you could, you could do it the other way as well, of course. Um, but, you know, uh, it, and you can even focus it. Like if, if it's too broad a spectrum to go what's boring you or what's exciting you, um, you, can, you can focus it on you know, what would, um, the things that, uh, are routine things in a weekend that you'd want to get rid of and the things that you wish we could add into a weekend. Mm. Like, you know, um, the, the top five dates I'm bored of. Yeah. Uh, five things I'd love to do on a date. Um, you know the um, you know you can you can use any subject heading on it, and you can either write your own list or you can write a list of a, you know what you think the other persons are. Mm. Um, it's just a form of communication and and uh, connection. But yeah. I did find it fascinating when these improvisers who you know work together weekly were walking around the room going, "Yeah, uh, you love playing Shakespeare." And the person went, that's actually on my I'm really bored of list. And you could see people go, what? But you're so good at it. It's like, yeah, that's why it's on my board list. Everybody keeps asking me to do it. And then kind of restricting my ability to let loose. I'm bored with it. I want to be challenged. And people going, oh, wow, right. We've boxed you into something that you always do. It was quite fascinating. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, Patty, I really appreciate all your time um, from mm. from the future. And the f- <laughs> I, I got to say, the future looks bright. And you, you, you're going to have to wear shades. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, Patty's website is pattystylesstiles.com. And you can go there to find out more about the work that she does. And she travels the globe six months out of the year teaching workshops on improvisation. So it could be a great thing for you to do. could be a great thing for you to do with your partner um, to go and take an improv workshop. And she, Patty, you said you're working on a book, right? I am. I am working on a book. Um, it will come to life at some point. So the problem being an improviser is every time I sit down to write, I end up going off in new tangents. So <laughs> it might it might be like Game of Thrones for impro. Who knows? It sounds intriguing. <laughs> well, we will make sure that as when that comes out, that all our listeners find out. And if you are interested in finding out more information about Patty, please do visit her site or you can visit neilsatin.com slash improv, I-M-P-R-O-V. And you can download the show guide for this episode and uh, we will ensure that you are also kept abreast of what is happening in Patty's world. So hopefully this excursion into the world of improvisation has been helpful for you. I'm really curious to hear what you try at home, what's powerful, what's not. Um, So please drop me a line and let me know or uh, join us in our Facebook community, the Relationship Alive community. And uh, also you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444. 
and that will give you instructions on how to download the show guide and also ensure that you're in touch with everything that's happening here. And it'll give you a way to get in touch with me. So uh, thanks again, Patty, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the listeners for listening. Um, Make your partner look good. And again! Again. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.